today as we come to the table. Are you a secretary? Are you working on cars? What are you doing? Do it for Jesus. There are guys in that garage that don't know the Lord. Do your best job for your boss. And when the opportunity is there, now don't take your know, work hours and, and witness for Jesus because you owe that man that's paying you eight hours of work. But on lunchtime and it breaks, share the Lord. Talk to them. You know, you're working in an office somewhere. As people come in, look for opportunities. God, give me an opportunity to share. Begin to share with them. My point is simply this. Don't wait until you think you've got the call that God has given you to do. Get started right now. Do and call where you are. There are some people that when you look at them, you think they've got it. I don't know what it is, but that's what they've got. The X factor, if you will. You want to know a secret? The people who are the most successful are the ones who get up and do something. They didn't get to where they are by wishful thinking. Well, thanks for staying with us today as we come to the table. The daily Bible study program of Pastor Mark Kirk of Calvary, Knoxville. In today's message... Pastor Mark encourages you to get up and do something for Jesus. Do it today. Don't sit around waiting for some stroke of luck. Wherever you are, Jesus wants you to serve him right there. He wants you to be his witness to the people that are already all around you. That's your calling. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of John, chapter 1, with today's edition of Come to the Table. John chapter 1, verse 43. Notice what it says. The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, follow me. And Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said, well, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, and he said, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you're the Son of God. You're the King of Israel. And Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You'll see greater things than these. And he said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the call that you give each one of us. Lord, as we look at you today calling your disciples and asking them to follow you, you've asked each one of us to follow you. Lord, some of us have answered that call and we're already following. Some of us have answered at a distance. We're not following closely, but we are following. But I know, God, you're going to be calling everyone in this room to follow you no matter where they are. And so I pray, God, we would hear your voice asking us to follow. And God, give us the courage to do it and to follow through and to follow you. And so God, open your word to us and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We are all called to follow the Lord. Every one of us. You know, you might think, well, I've not been called to follow, or maybe I've been called to follow, and some follow closer than I follow. The bottom line is the Bible says that Jesus calls everyone, but not everyone answers the call. Some of us have been called, and we're right there immediately. We start following close, and Lord, we're never leaving you. Some of us have been called, and we're following at a distance, like Peter that night when he betrayed the Lord. He followed at a distance, and it's because he was following at a distance, he betrayed the Lord. Some of us this morning may not be following at all, and this might be the first time you've ever heard God's voice calling you, follow me. But there's going to come a time in everyone's life when the Lord will say, follow me to you, and you've got a choice to make. We now come to that time for some more of the disciples of the Lord. Now, we saw Andrew and Peter, remember, called earlier. 
We now come to the third day in Jesus' revealing of who he was. John revealed that he was the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world on that first day. The second day he pointed to him again as Jesus came to the riverside and said, Behold the Lamb of God. I remember Andrew and Peter you know, went to follow him. And now we come to the third day of Jesus' public ministry. And we're going to see he, call, he calls some more disciples. And he's always calling disciples to himself. Uh, and it's no different today. Again, he calls when he chooses to call and we decide to follow or we decide not to follow. Uh, but it is interesting to me to note the other gospels tell us that when he called them, many of them didn't follow him closely at first. That's why when I prayed that prayer, some follow right away and some follow later. Some of us have heard the call of God and we've drawn closer to God, but we haven't really fully committed. And the disciples, if you're like that, the disciples, many of them were like that as well. It was later on that God asked them for that full commitment, and they gave that full commitment. Not that he didn't want them to fully commit the day he called them, he did. But for some reason, we sometimes hold back a little bit until we feel ready or whatever the, the thing might be that we've got going on. And, and this morning, the Lord is calling you no matter where you are. He's calling you to follow close. Don't be a distant follower. Because it's distant followers that end up denying the Lord. And when we truly commit to the Lord, we realize that once we make that commitment, there's no turning back. God doesn't want us to come and then change our mind. He says, when you come to me, you need to follow me wholeheartedly. He said, if you put your hand to the plow and turn back, you're not worthy of me. It doesn't mean that if you put your hand to the plow and you've backslidden, that now you can't go to heaven. That's not what he was saying. You can repent and still come back. He will accept you. But what he's saying is, when I call you to follow me, I mean, give it your all. Don't be looking back at the world. Don't look at a way of escape or a way you might turn back. It's interesting, when Julius Caesar, according to history, landed on the shores of Britain with his Roman legions, he took a very bold and decisive step to ensure the success, not only of his military venture, but that none of his men would ever want to turn away from the battle or run. So what he did was he ordered his men to the edge of the cliffs of Dover, true history, commanded them to look down at the water below, and to their amazement, they saw each of the ships that they had just gotten off of and which they had just crossed the channel into the area that they were in flames and on fire. It was their only way of escape. Caesar had deliberately cut off any possibility of retreat, and now that his soldiers were unable to return to the continent, there was nothing left for them to do but advance and conquer. They had no other choice. When Jesus calls us to himself, he does the same thing for us. He burns every bridge behind us and says, there's nothing back there for you. It's time to move forward. You ever start following the Lord and hear the enemy start trying to remind you what it was like before you came to the Lord? Get back into the party crowd. Oh, remember the fun you had? Remember how great it was throwing up and feeling bad that next day? Do you remember? Can you just get those memories back? Sometimes he pulls that, doesn't he? He brings those memories back and says, you know what? It was easier. You didn't have to try so hard. Just You could relax and not worry about anything. And you know, everybody wasn't looking into your business or whatever he kind of brings to you in that thing. Even one glance back, you realize there's nothing to go back to. And I've seen the enemies done that to me before and try to pull me away. But when I go, where would I go? It's like Peter said to Jesus when he asked them, are you guys going to leave as well? And some of his disciples began to leave. He said, where are we going to go? You hold the words of life. And the same thing is true this morning, guys. Where would we go if the enemy's calling you back to the world and tempting you to go back into that old lifestyle? Just remember for a moment what it was like. It was a nightmare. It was darkness. It was emptiness. There's nothing for us. All we have now is to move forward in the battle to conquer. And he's told us that we're more than conquerors, which means all we have to do is follow him and we're going to find the victory. Well, that's what he's doing with the disciples today. He's calling new disciples, adding more to the ones he's already called. And again, just now kind of building up that disciple base. But we're going to see that he does the same thing with us that he did with them. And, and remember what has happened. He's got, again, Andrew and, and Peter have come. And now they're starting to tell other people and fill up. And notice what happens here in verse 43. Look what it says. It says, in the following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee. And he found, notice, he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. So Philip also being from the same place of Andrew and Peter who had already been called by the Lord. And so calling guys from the same area, we don't know the reasons for that, but it's interesting. Uh, now that Jesus has begun his official ministry, the first thing I want you to note here is he got busy about the Father's business. I mean, this is day three. He showed up, he's introduced as the Lamb of God. He comes back again, shown as the Lamb of God. His first disciples begin to follow him. On day three, he's gathering more disciples. And what's my point in that? Jesus was very focused in what he was supposed to do while he was here, and he got busy. And guys, we're called to do the same thing. 
we need to have a, a real direction in our life. We have a purpose. God has given us that. It's to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. We need to be about our Father's business, even as Jesus was about his Father's business. And you know as well as I do, there's a lot of distractions down here. A lot of things can get us distracted where we aren't about our Father's business, but we need to get going. We need to get busy. Now, let me just say this. Whenever I say that, I think that a lot of times uh, people think, okay, be about my father's business or whatever, but Mark, I don't know what I'm called to do. So I hear that and I want to serve the Lord, but I don't know what I'm called to do. Listen, I've said this before and I'll say it again. Bloom where you're planted. It's a very simple way of saying, what are you doing right now? Are you a secretary? Are you working on cars? What are you doing? Do it for Jesus. There are guys in that garage that don't know the Lord. Do your best job for your boss. And when the opportunity is there, now don't take your work hours and, and witness for Jesus because you owe that man that's paying you eight hours of work. But on lunchtime and it breaks, share the Lord. Talk to them. You know, you're working in an office somewhere. As people come in, look for opportunities. God, give me an opportunity to share. Begin to share with them. My point is simply this. Don't wait until you think you've got the call that God has given you to do. Get started right now. Do and call where you are. God's calling you right now for that. I guarantee you, as you begin to do that, if God has something different for you in your life, he's going to lead you into it. But so many people wait around. You know, waiting. What am I going to do? Listen, I want to encourage you guys even more than that, to find what you love and do that for Jesus. If you have nowhere else to start, I'm going to give you something to start with. What do you love to do? You say, well, I, well I'll, stay, I'll, I'll leave it with cars. I love to work on cars. I love cars. I, okay, great, great. First of all, don't love cars more than Jesus or there's a problem. But you know what? Love cars and use it to reach people for Jesus. You can't tell me there are guys out there in your circle that work on cars that don't know the Lord. Do a car thing. Talk about Jesus. Make a purpose that you're going to say, you know what? We're going to come over. We're going to work on cars. We're going to drive somewhere. We're going to do whatever. But then make up your mind. At this point, I'm going to share with him. I'm going to share why, why I'm doing this, why I invited him today. Find what you love and do it. I love the testimony of Pastor Chuck, and you guys have heard it before, where he said he would go from church to church to church. He's the founder of, of, of Calvary Chapel. And he said he had two years worth of sermons. This is before Calvary Chapel existed. And he would do two years, and then when that two years ran out, he'd move somewhere else and do those same sermons for two years. And then when those two years ran out, he'd do those same sermons for two more years. He finally moved to a place where the surfing was really good. And he said, I don't want to leave here. The surfing is great. Now, you might say that's an awfully fleshly motivation, isn't it? Well, yes, it is, but God used it because he didn't want to leave where the surfing was good. He said, how can I make this thing last longer? I'll start teaching the entire Bible line by line and verse by verse. We'll never finish. I can die here and serve forever. And I'm adding some to it, but that's what he was sharing with us one time as pastors. He really wanted to be able to stay longer and do that. God took his love of surfing, and I know there was more to it than that. I'm not going to just say it was the love of surfing, but he used his love of surfing to make him sit still in one place and realize he needed to come up with a different system than just doing topicals every two years and said, I'm going to teach the body of Christ, the entire word of God, all the way through from beginning to end. And a whole movement was started. Who knows what God will do with you if you will take your love of this, your love of that, your desire to do this, and say, I'm going to do this for Jesus. Now, don't just stamp a fish on it, okay? You know, I love to whatever, and then just put a fish on the back of your car and tell people that you're a Christian or whatever. No, purpose in your heart, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to invite some unbelievers, and at this moment, I'm going to share the Lord with them, and then pray for boldness, and pray for courage to do it. It's amazing. Look, when you get around other people that like what you like, it opens doors. It opens doors. It's kind of funny, you know, as I started, when I started riding motorcycles, and I, I rode as a kid. You know, people thought when I got my Harley, oh, midlife crisis, midlife crisis, Martin needs something. Honestly, I rode motorcycles for years. It's something I've always loved. I grew up riding them with my friends. And I just wasn't able to get one through all the years of college. And then when I got married, uh, Tracy didn't want me to get one because she thought something might happen to me. She thinks now I'm expendable because, again, I'm older. So it's okay. I'm just kidding. But for whatever the reason, God opened the door up for me again to do something that I love. I love to ride motorcycles. I have since I was a kid. And I found something neat. I didn't know. There's a whole community in the Harley community. You get on a Harley. I mean, they see you, if they saw me today, they go, yeah, that's just kind of a straight-laced guy, whatever, pastor, whatever. Probably wouldn't say anything. You get on a Harley, and they, all they do is pass by you. And I got this thing where you're riding, they just kind of drop their hand. And you know, it's just kind of cool. He's, oh, they're dropping their hand. Drop their hand. And you're riding along, you know, drop the hand. It's just, it's just the way that the Harley guys all say, hey, bro, you know, yeah, riding the Harley. You know. 
And so now, you know, I'd, you know, drop the hand or wave or whatever. You know, you don't want to be like the really guy, you know, the nerd, you know, whatever, right? <laughs> but what's amazing to me is I found out when, I, when I'm in the Harley gear and I'm around the guys, I'm one of them. They accept me. They're like, hey, man, yeah, this. And they talk and all. When you find a group of people that like what you like, it opens up a door. Use that door. Use it. Say, so well, it, maybe it's fishing. Maybe it's golf. Maybe it's sports. Something connects you together. And I encourage you guys, truly, as a body, find what you love right now and say, you know what? I'm going to use this as a ministry. And start inviting people together. You can put together a small group, and we'll cover you. We'll be a covering here at Calvary Chapel for your small group. Listen, if it's truly something you're doing for God and we see God in it, we'll make it a ministry here at Calvary Chapel. So don't think, oh, I can't do a kinship because I can't sit in a little circle and, you know, and, and, and lead people or whatever. But I can hang out and, you know, do this and work on cars or do that or do that. Listen, that can be a ministry. Make it a ministry. And, and so don't think you have to wait on some call from heaven to, to just do missions work or call to be a pastor or whatever. Use where you are to spread the gospel. It's amazing. Everyone out there, no matter where they are, they're hurting. They're hurting. And they may have on their leather and look tough and talk like, they're hurting. They're hurting. Their lives are falling apart. And a lot of times, it's the guys like that, they're hurting the most. They need somebody to just say, you know what, there's hope. Would you like some hope? I've got some hope to share with you. And they want to hear it. So use those opportunities. And so, you know, God here is calling them where they are. And I like the fact he called them from a fishing town. He's going to now take these fishermen and make them fishers of men. But notice, he's not going to say you can never do what you like anymore. You can never have fun anymore. You've got to get into this thing where you're just always a dude, you know, whatever. You, you can't enjoy life anymore. God has given you all things richly to enjoy. All he's asking is make me first, put God first, and then use it for God's glory. I'm sure that God wouldn't mind if they'd have walked to the riverbank and fished a little more after they were saved. But they had to first be fishers of men. I remember, again, I've shared with you guys before, when I first gave my life to the Lord, I was playing music in the clubs for a living. I lived with my guitar. It was just always part of me. And the first thing God said to me was, just put your guitar down. It wasn't because God didn't want me to enjoy playing guitar anymore. He said, you need to get your priorities right, and you need to use your guitar for the reason I gave it to you. First of all, put me first, then use the guitar for me. And about six months into my walk, he told me to pick the guitar back up. And for years, I did worship. And, and, and I was now able to do it for him. So I was able to do something that I loved and enjoyed for the Lord. God will do the same thing with you guys. And, and so whatever it is that you love, use it for Jesus. And notice here it says he found Philip. Notice he found Philip. Philip didn't find him. Note that. I'm sure that Philip probably thought that he found him, but it was Jesus that found Philip. And, and what's interesting to me is in this is that the Bible teaches that Jesus is the one that comes and gets us. Now, guys, think that through for a minute. You might think, one day I woke up and I knew I needed God, and so I went to God. I finally came to God, and I found God. You didn't find God. God called you and seen him in. He says, before you were even under the fig tree, I knew you. We're going to see that in a minute when he talks to Nathaniel. God already saw you. He came after you where you were and called you as you were to be a part of his family. That should be exciting to you. Because if God looked at me in my wicked life before Christ... And he came after me, and he found me. I didn't find him. And he said, I want you to be a part of my family, Mark. That's amazing to me. If God wants me to be a part of his family, anybody can be a part of his family. I don't care what your background is or where you came from. God will make you a part of his family and a part of who he is. And so this is exciting because, again, that means he seeks us out. You might think, well, I'm I finally, glad I finally gave my life to the Lord and made my decision. You did have to make a decision to follow, but he's the one that called you. And he's the one that went after you in the midst of your sin. He's the one that chased you down and said, follow me. You thought you were just making a choice. You were responding to his call. And I love it because literally the words follow me here in the language, it's the active imperative. And what that means is he actively commanded Philip to follow he looked at him in a commanding voice. He said, follow me. Now, again, could Philip have denied that? Yes. The Bible says we all have a choice. A lot of people disobey the commands of the Lord. But when the Lord calls us, he does it with a very commanding voice. Follow me. Stop what you're doing right now. And he may be saying that to some of you this morning. Stop what you're doing right now. You know you're going down the wrong path. Stop. Turn around and follow me. And if you do, you're going to see amazing things like you've never dreamed or imagined. And that's what he's going to say in just a moment to Nathaniel. But he's saying it to us this morning as well. And so follow. I love it. It's interesting. Philip's name means lover of horses. 
And Bethsaida means house of fish, which is where he was from. In a literal sense, these are literal names, but symbolically, I think there's a greater application here. And that is Jesus was saying to him, follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men. Stop horsing around and get serious about Jesus. And yet at the same time, at the same time, if he really was a lover of horses, do you think it would have been okay with the Lord if Philip had used horses to reach people for Christ? You better believe it. You better believe it. So what if you add some horsepower to your ministry? Go for it. I'm not trying to be corny this morning. It's natural corn, all right? <laughs> None of this is in my notes. I mean, uh, some, you know, well, some of it. I mean, the horsing around part. But the bottom line is it doesn't mean you can't be a lover of horses and still be a fisher of men. Are you guys with me? Do what you love, but do it for Jesus. Stop sitting around and waiting on some opportunity and some mysterious call. Because if you start doing what you love and do it for Jesus, he will direct you. He'll grab a hold of you and say, all right, good, good. Now you're going. Now this way. Now that way. And he'll direct you. But we have to get moving before he directs. And so I love it. Don't give up what you love. Just use what you love for the Lord. And so he calls him. And now Philip in verse 44 was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael. And notice this, this is how ministry works. God calls one, one goes to the other, one goes to the other, and you just keep going to the next person and passing it on. So he called him. Now, he again, through Philip, uh, he's going to call Nathanael. It's still God doing the call, but notice Philip found Nathanael and said to him, look, we have found him, again, thinking he found him. <laughs> we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, come and see. I love it. The same thing that Jesus said to Andrew and Peter when they were following him. Now uh, Philip says, hey, you want to find out if anything good can come out of Nazareth? Come and see. And really that's all God asks us to do. As believers, if we want to lead other people to Christ, it's just to say, you know what? Have you heard about him? You know, he loves you and he's real. Come and see. Well, I don't know that I believe that. Well, come and see. You know, talk to me more about it or invite them to church. Just come and see and then let God do the work from that point on. And so um, it's interesting. It says here, he said that, that we found the one that Moses and the prophets wrote about. And that is, obviously, they believed the word of God. God's word said it, we believed it. And guys, there's a real challenge to God's word today. A lot of people challenging God's word and challenging the validity of God's word. I was speaking with someone just before the service. There are those in the pulpit today who, who challenge the inerrancy of God's word. God's word is infallible. It's eternal, and, and we are to believe in it and trust in it. And that's exactly what they were doing because they believed in God's word and trusted in God's word. God called them, and he brought them into his flock. He brought them into his fold. And so this is exactly what's happening with these guys. Hey, you believed in me. You read about me. Here I am. He says, you got to meet him. Come and see. And notice Jesus saw Nathaniel. So Nathaniel says, yeah, I'm going to do it. And look at verse 47, Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, note that, and he said to him, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no deceit. Now I find this interesting, the fact that he uses Israelite and deceit, because remember the father of the Israelites was Jacob. And what did Jacob's name mean? Deceiver. And so he's saying, hey, a descendant of Jacob, the deceiver in whom there is no deceit. It's almost as if to say, if I can use Jacob, I can certainly use you, Nathanael. Thank you for listening to another edition of Come to the Table with Pastor Mark Kirk. We're working our way through John, and there's more to gain from this book in God's Word. Before becoming a disciple of Jesus, John had been a simple fisherman. He and his brother were just trying to make a living in a way that seemed reasonable in that time and place. But God gave him a different calling, and it forever changed his life. What about you? What is it that you're doing? and that God's called you to. Maybe it's different than what you expected or anticipated, but our hope is that through John's writings, you're coming to a realization of what God's doing in your life as well. Come to the Table is a ministry of Calvary Knoxville in Knoxville, Tennessee. If you're interested in getting to know us in person, come join us. We'd love to meet you and hear what God's doing in your life. Service times can be found at our website, thewaymedia.net. Just look for the Calvary Knoxville tab. If you can't make it in person, join us online. We stream our services through the Way Media app, which you can download from your app store or right from the waymedia.net. If you have questions about the teaching you heard today, you can call us at 865-609-1385. That number again is 865-609-1385. 
1385. That's all the time we have for today, but we pray that you found this teaching to be a blessing. We look forward to you joining us for another edition right here in the book of John. So don't miss the next edition of Come to the Table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.